Bonjour à tous et à tous, à tous et à toutes. Uh, good morning, or rather good afternoon, uh, regardless, depending on where you are. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm, we're so used to doing these uh, at all various times of the day and various time zones, so apologies for losing track of time just there at the beginning. Thank you very much for joining us today at the Institute uh, for Peace and Diplomacy for today's uh, webinar on multipartisanship, Canadian interests, and Canadian foreign policy. Uh, first, before we get started, just a very brief uh, word on the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. IPD is a Canadian nonprofit and nonpartisan foreign policy think tank dedicated to promoting sustainable peace through diplomacy, dialogue, and constructive engagement. Since the end of the Cold War, we contend at IPD that North Atlantic foreign policy has experienced an intellectual fatigue and moral complacency that is increasingly threatening its credibility and relevance in a post-COVID age in a world characterized by heightened international resistance to global hegemony, coupled with new great powers competing for influence and recognition. In a time as dynamic and transformative as ours, there is a critical need for provocative, unconventional, and independent voices in statecraft and in foreign policy. IPD aims to address this deficit by cultivating a network of experts, scholars, and practitioners who are ready to provide fresh perspectives and constructive ideas to resolve global security challenges and manage the coming great power competition through peaceful means. In doing so, we believe it is necessary to engage with questions of power and the Atlantic Bloc's role in the world in a more systematic, objective, and power-sensitive manner, bridging the wide gap that exists between theory and practice in North Atlantic foreign policy. Through our publications, conferences, policy briefings, and recommendations, IPD encourages policymakers and leaders in government, civil society, and, and the business community to adopt a more restrained and open-minded approach in managing the strategic challenges and geopolitical risks of the 21st century. And for, for today's discussion on that front, we are going to be discussing the question, as I've mentioned, of the absence of multipartisanship in Canadian foreign policy and whether this poses certain challenges for Canadian status uh, and interests in the world. Uh, at least since the premiership of Stephen Harper, foreign policy debates in Canada have been on their face relatively partisan, at least by comparison, compared uh, to, to earlier moments in Canadian history, touching not just on different priorities for policy, uh, but also of different narratives fundamentally of Canadian history and of national identity, extending from questions surrounding the legitimacy of the role of the UN and multilateralism in Canadian foreign policy to questions surrounding how to deal uh, with China in this new great power competition. Today, we will be discussing what Canada's interests are in this shifting world, what the possible consequences are of this increasing partisanship in Canadian foreign policy discourse for Canada's security and status in the world, and what a multipartisan consensus on foreign policy issues in Canada might look like. And for today's panel, we are very grateful and lucky to be joined by four excellent expert panelists. Uh, we have Chris Tilford, Jocelyn Coulon, Anne Fitzgerald, and Jean-Christophe Boucher, who are joining us today. I will introduce uh, each of them uh, in, uh, for, uh, before each of their presentations. And we are very lucky in particular to be joined by representatives, in this case, from uh, all four of Canada's four largest uh, pro provinces by population. So beginning off with uh, Chris Kilford to begin our set of presentations for today. Chris Kilford is a member of the National Board of the Canadian International Council, the CIC. He's the president of the CIC Victoria branch and vice chair of the Inclusion Project. He holds a PhD in history from Queen's University with a focus on civil military relations in the developing world. Chris is also a fellow with the Queen's Center for International and Defense Policy, a, a sessional professor with the Canadian Forces College, where he teaches online courses focused on geopolitical issues and an adjunct faculty member at Royal Roads University. Chris also enjoyed a 36-year career in the Canadian Armed Forces. He commanded a 4th Air Defense Regiment from 1991 to 2001, followed by various positions in the Department of National Defense, including Acting Director of Future Security Analysis and Military Liaison Officer with the Senate Committee on National Security and Defense. From July 2009 until July 2010, he deployed to Canada's embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, as the deputy military attaché, and upon his return to Canada, he commenced Turkish language, Turkish language training before heading to Canada's embassy in Ankara, Turkey, as the Canadian defense attaché at the rank of colonel, with cross accreditation to Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkmenistan, from July 2011 until July, July 2014. Chris retired from the CAF in September 2014. Chris, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zachary, and thank you very much also uh, to inviting, uh, inviting me to this panel. 
And uh, it's great to be here with this uh, super group of panelists as well. And I'm joining you today from Victoria, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations. And I've prepared some comments. So I'm gonna be referring to a piece of paper in front of me. And that's because I had so much to say and so little time to do it in. So uh, bear with me and I'll, uh, I'll see how I make out. So here's the first thing, in my view, I believe that there actually is a general consensus in Ottawa about what our foreign policy should be. Although I know that the two main political parties would never agree to what I've just said. But over the last 20 years, at least, have we actually seen much in the way of wild foreign policy swings by successive Canadian governments? I would say no. Of course, there's no question that when, the op when, in, when you're in opposition, one has far more foreign policy elasticity, but once in power, the room to maneuver often becomes much less. Now, speaking of foreign policy, many of you know that my organization, the Canadian International Council, has been involved in a grassroots examination of our foreign policy over the last year. We recently, in the past few weeks, conducted the largest deliberative democracy exercise ever held in Canada. We brought 420 randomly chosen Canadians together to discuss and debate uh, Canada's foreign policy and where we should be going in the future. And we called this exercise foreign policy by Canadians. In contrast to Pierre Trudeau's 1970 foreign policy, which was called foreign policy for Canadians. Now, when I look back at past government-led foreign policy examinations, there's no question in my mind that Prime Ministers uh, Trudeau, Mulroney, Chrétien, Martin, and Harper all wanted to put their own mark on Canadian foreign policy, but none fundamentally changed the basic objectives of protecting Canada's security, safeguarding our economic interests and maintaining fundamental freedoms. Now, with, with regards to the current government, uh, the same remains true. And I have some examples that I wanted to share with you today, specifically looking at the period from December 2000 until today. And during this sort of 20 year period, it's quite interesting to see that Liberals have been in power for about 10 years, just over 10 years, and Conservatives in power for just under 10 years. So what can we say about this particular period? Well, look, no matter who has been in power over this period, our support for defense and international assistance has always remained well below historical and international benchmarks. And when we look at defense in particular, Paul Martin's international policy statement and its defense section, the Harper government's Canada First Defense Strategy, and the current government's strong, secure, engaged. When you actually look at the details, there's really nothing fundamentally different about those defense policies. What else is there? Well, no matter who has been in power in the last 20 years, the number of Canadian peacekeepers working with the United, United Nations has continued to fall. And despite pledges by the current government to step up in UN peacekeeping, we're at the lowest levels of UN peacekeepers in the field that anyone can remember. Under the Chrétien, Martin, Harper, and Trudeau governments, Canada's military has become more and more focused on supporting NATO or similar operations ranging from Afghanistan to more recent deployments that have seen our troops employed on a wide arc that runs from Riga to Baghdad and sees our Navy making more and more forays into the Asia Pacific. Now, while, while today the current government and past uh, and the op position and past governments are understandably exasperated by the Chinese party. Our two-way trade with China has shown consistent growth since 2000, making China our second largest trade ports to China went up 8.19% in 2020 uh, I'm, to 25.0. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, Chris. I think we're having some some difficulty hearing you. I don't know if your signal is 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 good. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did get a little note. How's that? Is that okay? That's much better. Perfect. Thank you. Is that better? 
That's okay. Right. So just to return, perhaps if the conservatives came into power, we would boycott the 2022 Winter Olympics. We would pull out of the Asian infrastructure investment bank and much more, but we will see about that. Similar fashion, uh, the current government went in opposition and after coming into power, was keen to reestablish diplomatic relations with Iran. And we sent two delegations to Tehran in 2017. However, uh, in a vote in parliament in, in 2018, all parties coming to their senses, one might argue, uh, uh, voted not to establish diplomatic relations with Iran. Lastly, 80% of our international arms exports go to the Middle East outside of those that go to the US. And there's been no move to cancel the sale of light armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia, agreed to by the Harper government, by the current government, despite Saudi Arabia's dismal human rights record. So when we look at everything from Mitchell Sharp's 1972 third option to NAFTA in 1994, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Canadian-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, and now the new NAFTA, both liberal and conservative governments, once in power and for better and for worse, have demonstrated a similar understanding of what is deemed necessary to further our national interest. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, for those opening remarks. Uh, I neglected to introduce myself at the beginning of the panel. I'm Zach Pakin. I am a uh, non-resident research fellow at the Institute for Peace uh, and Diplomacy. And also for those of you uh, who have not yet posed a question already, uh, feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box using the Q&A function uh, below. Uh, moving along to our second presenter today in Kitchener-Waterloo, Anne Fitzgerald is the director of the Balsili School of International Affairs and a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University's Political Science Department. She has worked at both King's College London, University's International Policy Institute, and at Cranfield University, where she was the Director, Defense and Security Leadership. During her time at Cranfield, Anne led the UK government's, uh, fund, excuse me, the UK government-funded Global Facilitation Network for Security Sector Reform and Cranfield Center for Security Sector Management. Anne is widely published on issues concerning conflict, national security, and security sector governance, she holds a visiting professorship at other universities, including at Nkumba University in Uganda, Jima University in Ethiopia, Jala University in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, and Queen's University here in Canada. Anne has advised and has been seconded to work with a number of countries on issues related to national security policy and strategy related issues as well, including Ukraine, Lebanon, Canada, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Nepal, Botswana, Jamaica, Indonesia, Sierra Leone, Albania, Montenegro, and Nigeria. She's also supported internationally sponsored peace talks, including support to the African Union's high implementation panel during the post-referendum peace talks between North and South Sudan. In 2018, Anne was appointed as a senior research associate at RUSI in London. And thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. And I believe you're on mute. Thanks very much, Zachary. Very delighted to be here with you today. And I think it's a really important discussion that brings foreign and security policy issues down to fundamental basics, where there's often a lot of assumptions made. And um, I, I think in discussing issues concerning interests and values, it's always very important to know the difference between them and the definitions of them, et cetera. Because if you recall back in the 1970s, when there was a fishing dispute in the Bay of Fundy here in Canada, the uh, Coast Guard was on strike at the time and we had to protect our fishermen. So we sent out a naval ship and the communication from the ministry leading um, suggested that this was in protection of or in response to a vital interest. The Americans heard this announcement and they um, deployed a, a, a vessel as well, a destroyer, I believe. And so terminology got us off to a bit of a rocky start in that case, uh, all diffused very nicely. But uh, I think it's important to understand when we talk about national interests, you know, what, what are national interests as a concept? What's the difference between national interests and values? So when we talk about values, they're pretty universal concepts, individual freedoms, rule of law, human rights, and most of the world uses this. Most of the charters that we are party to talk about shared values, and this is what binds us together. Actually, interests are fairly universal as well, expressions of interest like sovereignty, security, 
prosperity, stable world order, and the promotion of our values. So where it gets different and where you see a national veneer going on things is how the detail of these interests are discussed because the detail of the interests are shaped by national values and national ideologies. So this is far from universal. Um, security interests are usually uh, prioritizing the protection of the territory, the protection of the population, because if you don't have those two things protected, then you don't have anything, you don't have your sovereignty. So um, during the Cold War, for example, our vital interest was to prevent a nuclear war. We could not do this with the military capability we had. Um, so we followed our best interest to de-escalate tensions elsewhere in the world and hence our foray into the world of peacekeeping. So national culture and national ideology really play a role in the interpretation of these interests. So for example, you see in our country some protests against vaccinations, which for some other countries would, would be an irrational thing. But this is what might happen in a individualistic national culture. It's the way we interpret our basic human rights and freedoms, freedom of choice, freedom of expression, etc. This is different to national cultures elsewhere, particularly the uh, Confucian culture that exists across Asian countries, um, which would focus more on um, uh, adherence to the needs of a community. And uh, this is what would be prioritized. So the quality of outcome versus the quality of opportunity. Um, and, and, and this is important when we're trying to understand like-mindedness between Canada and other countries too. We've got to look at the specific detail of national interests. And one thing that I've discovered over the years is the way in which civil society operates, the way in which civil society is mandated, et cetera, that can give you a good indication of what that specific detail is at the level of national interest. Um, you know, one would argue that our constitutional goals uh, would define us as a fairly communitarian society. They are peace, order, and good government. Uh, slightly different to um, uh, the way in which the US communicates these issues, um, the pursuit of happiness, liberty, fraternity, equality, um, even dating back to earlier revolutions in uh, the, the United States, issues concerning respect to the monarchy and respect to authority uh, were exercised quite differently than uh, the way they were in Canada. So um, the, the way in which our interests go beyond the North American continent is the reason why we need to prioritize strategic intelligence and the way in which these, um, the, the way in which intelligence uh, assess the global impact on our interests. So we're not insulated or isolated from the rest of the world for sure. Look at our dependency on supply chains, look at our experience in this pandemic, um, which proved that we have no capacity to defend ourselves from a pandemic. Uh, despite being warned about uh, such a, a pandemic from a medical intelligence community in the Five Eyes um, uh, community. And so this was a failure in our understanding of, of both pandemic preparedness and pandemic readiness, readiness of response. And you need, you need both. Uh, readiness refers to the capability. Um, so the it's important to have a unified approach on foreign and security policy. Uh, the British have demonstrated a fairly unified approach with 100% support in Parliament for its integrated security review. It's, it's not subject to, to politics in, in a way. Same with the Australian model. It's based on a national assessment of what's going on in the world and how it impacts on Australian interests. And then there is a um, unified approach to developing a security policy. This leads to more efficient use of resources and not a wastage of, of taxpayers' money. And as, as uh, the balance power shifts, uh, we will see more of a domestic impact of our um, uh, absence of security uh, decision-making and absence of security analysis. We do not feel threatened here in Canada, although many meteorologists and climatologists have warned that the next black 
swan punch will be uh, in the Arctic first and worst. Um, there is a big domestic impact to be considered here as well. Without a national education strategy, we will not attract the brightest and the best students and faculty. Um, we will uh, not have a, an economy that will allow our um, uh, newly arrived Canadians coming from other countries to use their skills properly. And, you know, I've, I've spoken to a number of um, those such individuals over the last few weeks who are returning to the continents they, they came from because they're feeling too de-skilled here in Canada. So there's a huge domestic impact of not having a unified approach to um, security issues and not recognizing that blurred distinction between the impact on domestic uh, issues and the impact on our international influence and outreach. I'll stop there and happy to discuss further in questions. Thanks very much, Anne, for those very thoughtful comments. On va passer maintenant à Jocelyn Coulon, qui est à Montréal. Il est chercheur au Centre d'études et de recherche internationale de l'Université de Montréal, Serium, depuis euh, 2017. Il a été membre de, du groupe des conseillers sur, sur les affaires internationales de Justin Trudeau en 2014 et 2015 et conseiller politique principal du ministre des Affaires étrangères, Stéphane Dion, en euh, 2016-2017. Il publiera, publiera en septembre un ouvrage sur l'identité internationale du Canada euh, et il est aussi euh, membre de notre conseil consultatif avec nous, avec l'Institut pour la paix et la diplomatie. Euh, merci beaucoup euh, d'être avec nous aujourd'hui, Jocelyn. Merci, Zach, pour cette invitation. Donc, je ferai ma présentation en français. Je voudrais d'abord dire que je suis assez d'accord avec les constats qui sont posés par nos deux conférenciers, nos deux précédents conférenciers, sur les différences ou le manque de différences qu'il y a entre les politiques conservatrices et libérales. Toutefois, je voudrais ajouter quelque chose. Les organisateurs de ce débat estiment que l'absence d'une politique étrangère cohérente et multipartite a déjà commencé à nuire à l'influence du Canada dans le monde, comme le démontrent les deux échecs subis lors de nos campagnes pour l'obtention d'un siège au, cons au Conseil de sécurité. J'utiliserai l'exemple du Conseil pour ajouter un, un élément supplémentaire à ce que les organisateurs ont déjà dit la question de l'identité internationale du Canada. Par le passé, toutes les victoires du Canada au Conseil de sécurité ont été acquises à un moment où le pays avait une identité internationale très forte. Cette identité a été construite autour de notre adhésion à l'internationalisme libéral. On peut dire que libéraux et progressistes conservateurs, au moins jusqu'au début des années 2000, partageaient à quelques nuances près les mêmes objectifs. Cela a donné des résultats positifs lors des campagnes pour les élections au Conseil pour les périodes de 1958-59, 67-68, 77-78, 89-90 et 1999-2000. Et même lorsqu'il y avait compétition entre trois pays pour deux sièges, le Canada a gagné haut la main. Nous avons toujours obtenu au moins 130 votes. Adam Chapnick, dans son livre publié il y a deux ans sur le Canada au Conseil de sécurité, rappelle que ces victoires étaient le résultat de deux facteurs, un bilan diplomatique exemplaire et un engagement personnel et quotidien du premier ministre et de son ministre des Affaires étrangères pendant les campagnes. Or, en 2010 et en 2020, tout a changé. Pendant ces deux campagnes, les dirigeants canadiens aimaient rappeler comment la voix du Canada était entendue dans le monde. Ils citent pour cela le fait que le Canada est le seul pays occidental à appartenir simultanément au G7, au G20, à l'ONU, à l'OTAN, à l'Organisation des États américains, au Commonwealth et à la francophonie. C'est vrai c'est un tableau de chasse impressionnant, mais qui visiblement n'a eu aucun impact lors des deux dernières campagnes du Canada pour l'élection au Conseil. En fait, les défaites de 2010 et de 2020 ont été tout simplement désastreuses. En 2010, le Canada a obtenu au deuxième tour de scrutin 70 votes et évidemment a été éliminé, 
Et en 2020, pire encore, il a été éliminé dès le premier tour avec 108 voix, alors qu'il était en compétition contre deux petits pays de 5 millions d'habitants, la Norvège et l'Irlande. Je rappelle pour mémoire que l'Allemagne, le Japon et l'Italie, trois autres membres du G7, n'ont jamais perdu leur campagne pour obtenir un siège. Le gouvernement Harper a expliqué la défaite par le vote des dictatures. Celui de Trudeau a pointé du doigt l'entrée tardive du Canada dans la compétition. Ses excuses sont simplistes. Je crois que le problème est ailleurs. Il est à Ottawa, aux affaires étrangères, au bureau du premier ministre, au sein des élites politiques. Notre diplomatie semble déréglée, semble incapable de fixer des objectifs et de les atteindre. Peut-être que dans le cas des relations avec les États-Unis, les choses sont plus simples, mais avec le reste du monde, j'ai l'impression que depuis 20 ans, elles se sont dégradées. Car il ne faudrait pas oublier qu'en plus des défaites au Conseil de sécurité, s'ajoutent nos mauvaises relations avec la Chine, la Russie, l'Inde et bien d'autres pays, l'incapacité à faire réélire Mme Jean à la tête de la francophonie ou de faire élire Bill Morneau à la tête de l'OCDE, à notre refus de participer aux opérations de paix, à notre lente disparition de l'Afrique, alors que toutes les grandes et moyennes puissances s'y précipitent. Tout cela participe d'une lente marginalisation du Canada sur la scène internationale et on ne comprend pas la raison profonde de ce délitement. Que se passe-t-il? Personnellement, j'y vois l'effet des hésitations et des retournements de nos positions diplomatiques sur les gouvernements Harper et Trudeau. Harper n'était pas très enthousiaste par l'internationalisme libéral et rêvait d'un Canada État guerrier, aligné avec les puissances anglo-saxonnes. Trudeau a voulu se reconnecter à cet internationalisme tout en adoptant les mêmes positions que les conservateurs. Il en découle que le Canada, sous ces deux gouvernements, s'est détaché de son identité internationale forte, sans pour autant en adopter une nouvelle susceptible d'établir un consensus parmi les Canadiens et d'intéresser le reste du monde. Cette nouvelle identité ou cette identité renouvelée était impossible à façonner car depuis une quinzaine d'années, le Canada, me semble-t-il, a perdu un des traits distinctifs de sa présence dans le monde, sa capacité d'initiative, sa tendance à essayer l'inédit, à prendre des risques. Il n'est donc pas surprenant de voir les membres de l'ONU ne plus savoir de quoi au juste le Canada est-il le nom sur la scène internationale. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Jocelyn, pour cela. On va passer à notre dernier intervenant maintenant, Jean-Christophe Boucher, à Calgary. He is an assistant professor at the School of Public Policy at the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary. He's currently responsible for a $1.3 million uh, funded research grant funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the Department of National Defense, and Alberta Innovates. Uh, he's a director of research in civil military relations at the Canadian Defense and Security Network, Uh, and is also a fellow at CJAI, uh, CJAI, the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, uh, a, a research fellow at the Center for the Study of Security and Development at Dalhousie University, uh, and a senior fellow at the Centre Universitaire de Recherche sur les Relations Internationales du Canada et du Québec. Uh, he holds a BA in History from the University of Ottawa, an MA in Philosophy from the Université de Montréal, and a PhD in Political Science, uh, in political science excuse me, from Université Laval specializes in foreign policy analysis with an emphasis on data and public policy. Jean-Christophe, c'est à vous. À vous la parole. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I think a lot of us have been in the last couple of years uh, thinking a lot about um, Canada's renewal in foreign policy and trying to think about what was wrong, what was right, and where we should go. I think a lot of us who engage with political elites in Ottawa, uh, either at Global Affairs Canada or elsewhere, often are amazed how, you know, some people seem, that, seem to think that, you know, everything is fine in Canadian foreign policy, whereas a lot of us are, feel that this is not the case. Um, 
I would make the argument, and this is, I think I'm going to try to focus my, my thing on, on, on an argument. I think my argument is that whatever happened in the past is different now. And every, any assumption that we can regain, renew, refine, continue, anything that we've done in the past is probably wrong. And um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the last couple of years have dramatically changed the landscape of Canadian foreign policy decision making. And that needs a, a greater renewal uh, and a, re a greater refocus on what we can do and what we should do in international affairs. And I'll like organize my, my, my thinking to like two terms uh, in two like tracks. I think Canada's Canadian foreign policy is really now in a kind of upheaval, uh, both from the international system uh, pressure and both from the domestic pressures. And it, I'm going to try to focus on both. At the international level, I think uh, my panelists kind of made this really um, like easy for me to kind of go super fast. Uh, things are different now than what we have seen since, you know, the end of the Second World War. The liberal world order is in disarray. There is a decline in the U.S., a rise of China, a rise of regional actors. Uh, there's less support also in democracies for the kinds of things that we took for, for granted in the international world order, the free, the free movement of goods, the free movement of people, and, and adherence to international governance. What I'm seeing now is that there's a lot less support for this, these notions, and it's extremely difficult for Canada uh, with limited resources, either because we are unwilling to give these resources or put these resources forward or because we are unwilling to do it politically um, has been difficult to do. Any kind of interest, like ideas about how Canada could, you know, maintain the rule-based order is probably um, an utopia more so than anything else. So the international system now is resisting more and more to the kinds of ideas that really put Canada at the forefront of international affairs for the last 50 years, and things are changing really fast. Uh, and in some ways, we haven't collectively um, brought this home in terms of the political elites in Ottawa and across Canada. We are still really devoted, a lot of us are still devoted to these kinds of key ideas, and, and we have limited capacity to think in terms of innovation, as Chesney would say, or daring new ideas. At the domestic level, I think, and, and, and like, like a comma or like parenthesis, the fact that we haven't really tried to do, and this is my soapbox, but the fact that we haven't been unwilling to actually go into any kind of exercise in redesigning a white paper on foreign policy in the last 16 years is, amazing to me. And every time I talk to people at Global Affairs, they say like, nah, everything's fine. We don't need, you know, academics and people to tell us what to do on foreign affairs. And, and the fact that, you know, other countries are doing this on a, you know, five-year basis, the Americans do this, the Australians do this, the Japanese are doing this, they're publishing these documents all the time. It seems that Canada making the argument like we're good without policy papers is interesting. Close parenthesis. Um, on the domestic side, I think there's also a lot of, uh, there's a disconnect and a, a misconception of what we can and should do on foreign policy. Our, in, in the grand scheme of things, we don't really understand really well what Canadians actually want. The kinds of things that CIC did is really a movement forward and kind of thinking about, okay, how can we think about what Canadians want in foreign policy? How can we align the kind of priorities we have with Canadian you know, interests and, and priorities, and how can we move this forward? This is not to say that, you know, we should align completely our, you know, policy making on what Canadians want, but there's, there's actually a need to, for policymakers to either, you know, align in some ways and understand really what Canadians want out of their foreign policy. In the grand scheme of things, it's Canadians are actually paying for that foreign policy. And also, it, when there's a disconnect between what the people want and what the policymakers and elites think that there should be, then there's a educational piece to it. You, you have to do the work and go outside and kind of explain to Canadians why you're doing X instead of Y, which I would say the last two, 20 years have been short of and, and governments have been unwilling to actually make this case often. And I would say there's like, so um, based on our short grant last year, in October, actually, uh, we actually conducted a large survey on uh, public policy. 
Um, and we've asked Canadians a, a bunch of questions on foreign policy, but also on national defense. And what we got is really interesting things. And two things came out of this that I, I think is kind of different. The first one is that we're seeing more and more a cleavage amongst vote, uh, policy, like political parties voters. There's more and more a disconnect between what liberals and, and progressive forces in Canada think about what a Canadian foreign policy should be and what more uh, conservative people think. In fact, that this, this divide between this you know, political ideological divide explains more the variance of what people adhere to than linguistic divide that, you know, made the last 50 years of our conversation. In the grand scheme of things, we see a lot of progressive much more focusing on values and conservatives more and more focusing on interests. And when we talk about values, uh, we actually ask them, like, what kind of values should Canada promote? And it wasn't human rights and freedom. Well, it was. But a lot of them actually said inclusivity, equality, and, um, and inclusiveness, uh, which was diversity, inclusiveness, and equality, which was kind of an interesting. That was like 25% of people actually said this. In terms of interest, conservative voters mostly were the most willing to say that our trade and economic interests prevails over everything else. Uh, which seems to be what we've thought. There's a second part that we saw in the data that was really interesting, which is uh, a generational shift in Canadians thinking about foreign policy issues. When we try to kind of branch out how, like who would adhere what, the 55 and plus, the AstraZeneca people could, uh, were actually more supportive of UN focus uh, intervention and younger generation were a lot less willing to commit to peacekeeping and multilateral intervention. And, and this is something that Jesse and I had like as, as, a, as a conversation. Is it because the policymakers are not making these policies and thus, you know, young Canadians don't see the advantage of this? Or is it, you know, what, what's the cart and what's the ox and which one can I put? And I actually don't, I actually don't know. Um, but I think this is a problem when you think of Canadian foreign policy where there's a generational split in how people think about this issues. And there has been a lot of support in, in older Canadians toward traditional uh, foreign policy and, un, and younger generations have been less willing to think in those terms. And I think we need to kind of have this conversation in Canada and I'll stop. Thanks very much, Jean-Christophe. So we're not gonna go on to the question and answer period. Thank you for those of you who've already sent your questions into the Q&A box, so we'll get to those in a second. But I thought I would just open it up by posing a question to Anne, uh, where you talked a little bit about the, the reality that Canada's interests are not limited exclusively to, to the continent and that you know, they are far reaching in some ways. Um, so how do we have to develop the resources necessary in order to be able to take on such an expansive uh, agenda? I mean, would it not make more sense to be particularly focused on a small number of, of, uh, of issues? What's your sort of approach for, for dealing with, with this fundamental strategic dilemma that Canada faces? Yeah, well, I want to pick on something that Jean-Christophe uh, mentioned about, you know, having a, a regular analysis of this, and, and that's absolutely vital, um, involving all the right stakeholders, because um, if, if, if we're clear on what our interests are, and hopefully some um, good, useful out outputs will come from the CIC's current exercise in, in generating a discussion on what people feel our values, our interests, and our foreign policy uh, should, should be leading to, then we can get an idea of a strategic policy response. So it's like a mathematical equation in a way. If we know what our interests are, we know what's going on in the world in sufficient detail to know how that impacts on our interests, then it equals a policy response on our side. Now that policy response cannot be aspirational. And in, in my work uh, in many countries across the world in on national dialogue and national security policy, sometimes the, um, there's the response is, well, let's tackle all of these things which are just not able to be resourced, right? So hard choices need to be made at that stage. So once we prioritize our policy response, then we look at capability and capability is so important at the moment. I mean, we cannot patrol our land at the moment suitably and sufficiently. We outsource a lot of that to the United States. The United States of America has been looking after the security of the Western world for a long time now. 
But, you know, we have Russians and other adversarial groups that can fire missiles, that can hit our Arctic. Do we have naval capacity that can get through all the Arctic waters? No, we don't. We don't have refueling capacity up there. We don't have submarines that can operate under the ice. Our Air Force can hit every square mile of this country, but even still, there are some interoperability issues there. So there is a capability that then needs to be in place to support those priorities. So a real fair, full and frank discussion according to a reproducible methodology that would hopefully be engaged with every four or five years as per our, our, uh, the, the approach of our allies would help us come to some definitive conclusions about these resources. But I mean, at the moment we're, I don't know what my fellow panelists think, but I, I fear that we're being left behind. I mean, pande pandemic notwithstanding, the British went on to complete a very thorough and comprehensive integrated security and foreign policy uh, piece. Uh, the Australians did the same, the Americans did the same. And whilst they forge ahead, I mean, um, the Biden administration announced last week that its national security would be hip to hip with economic security. It has to have a foreign policy that caters to the American middle class. So it's all about green tech metals and the pursuit of minerals and the access to that minerals, uh, mineral base over and above China. Um, and, and that's right now how China is spreading further dominance, um, access and consumption of that mineral base. So everybody else seems to be fairly definitive and clear, especially amidst what will be uh, an economic recessionary period where hard choices have to be made about their foreign policy priorities. We need to do the same. Uh, before we give uh, JC a chance to come back on that, I was wondering if Chris could maybe chime in, if, if that's all right, because uh, some of Anne's comments there had a great deal to do about uh, the, the ability to identify strategic interests and fundamentally rethink the security implications, which other Western countries have been able to do with far greater you know, uh, complexity and, and comprehensiveness than, than Canada has. Uh, Chris, I was wondering if you could draw on your experience in the CAF and maybe explain to us if there's you know, what's, what's going on there? And is this uh, an intellectual culture issue that we need to confront somehow in Canada? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you can see what the British do and what the Americans do. They, they're very good about publishing documents where they point fingers at various countries and label them as enemies of the state and that sort of thing. And from Canada, from a Canadian perspective, of course, we take a, a much uh, softer view of things. I think one of the reasons why we don't get so wrapped up in, in doing um, massive analysis every few years is that when you do look back at what we have done, the body that's there, you, you actually see that, that not, a lot actu not, not a lot changes despite the, the world shifting and, and powers coming up and powers going down, uh, perhaps because of the luxury of where we sit on the planet that our space for maneuver, room for maneuver actually is quite limited. And so you seem to find it being the same old, same old. I, I, a couple of years ago, I did a study of the past three defense policies and I was the, um, um, the, the, the dep deputy director of the military team putting the Canada First defense strategy together. So I kind of know this a little bit. And, and when I looked at all of those policies, you know, we were all doing the same things, you know, 12 frigates, so many airplanes, of course, we still need to figure that one out. Um, same kind of operational mindset. So I, I think there's a bit of complacency, actually. When I looked at what happened in the last election with Andrew Scheer, when it came to foreign aid, the best, we, best he could come up with was to say, I'm going to cut foreign aid by 25%. And of course, we've seen Aaron O'Toole recently say that he wouldn't do that. But that's about it when it comes to maneuver. Uh, yes, we have a feminist foreign policy. Previously, we've narrowed the focus of, of countries that we're going to give development aid to. But I always see it as tinkering, tinkering around, tinkering around the edges, while the actual money we dedicate to foreign assistance gets less and less and less. So um, I think at the end of the day, I would say it's, it's complacency. Now, having said that, though, Zachary, we seem to muddle through. We have the 10th largest economy in the world. You know, we're the envy of everybody. Uh, how is this? We seem to make it work. 
JC, over to you. And we also have uh, some questions uh, from the audience for you regarding the um, preferences. I was wondering if you could draw on the data that you have uh, and, and tell us a little bit more about the preferences of younger Canadians. If they're not so interested in multilateralism and, and the like, and, and then the UN, you know, where, what are we likely to expect from their preferences going forward? And, and I'll add a, an additional question to that, uh, which is that Canadians already, to a large extent, think that we do a lot when it comes to foreign policy. The, there's this cliche that we punch above our weight. And now that's not necessarily true anymore, obviously. But the, the minute that you say that Canada should be doing more in the world, already that starts to offend a lot of Canadian sensibilities because they say, what do you mean we should do more? We're already punching above our weight. So it's almost an identity related question, you know, for us that we need to confront. And, and it might even be, you know, subconscious rather than, you know, something that could be explicitly and, and more easily, you know, resolved by way of policy changes. So I'm wondering if you could re reflect on, on those couple of thoughts. And if you wanted to come back at, at anything that's been said as well, please feel free. Wow. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I think national defense is actually really doing well in terms of, of developing, you know, a, a policy and trying to set, you know, at least the last one we have, you know, sets, you know, targets and money that we're going to spend. And then we can actually assess whether that works or not. There's all this hidden, you know, missing chapter in, in Strong, Secure, and Engage, which is about NORAD modernization, which is probably as big as all the other chapters. Um, but we knew this when they drafted this. And, and so I think national de uh, defense has been way better at, at thinking through, you know, what do we need in terms of priorities, how we're going to set up, you know, like strategies to you acquire those, how can we going to plan this out? On, on the on the foreign policy side, I think there's a lot of work to be done. We have been on, you know, under investing in diplomacy. Uh, like a lot of our diplomats now can't speak French. A lot of our diplomats are on temp work uh, and, or on contract work. Like the, 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 there's actually really no money or no real thinking about how can we engage our foreign policy in, in, a, in, a, in a systematic fashion. We muddle through um often we're just lucky right we just essentially we're lucky that not nothing we do actually has any kind of big you know impact on on what we have so who cares if we have one or not um and but i like and but i still believe that if we want to you know try to achieve little things that we think is important for us we have to kind of think strategically global affairs think of about these things but we have to write them down every five years and then we can assess whether or not they're successful or not we can say like ah this didn't work this worked you know and and then we can have a like an intelligent debate on 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 where we're going how to divest resources in a way that actually makes sense do we want to go to africa if the answer is yes okay let's put money toward that and how do we do this and how can we track this down i'm you know i've i've been involved somewhat in in trying to measure gac or other departments global engagement and to be honest, it's, I don't think they know what that means. I don't think they know what it means to be globally engaged. And I don't think they know what measures allows them to say we did better and less well in terms of engaging. It's not the number of people that are, you know, sitting in your, on your Zoom call that actually, like, that's in global engagement. I think there's a lot of work to be done at all level of government on, in this respect. The data on, uh, so, for the internationalists amongst ourselves, the younger generation seems to be let, less enthusiastic about these kinds of principles. But what we're getting is, is a lot more focus on, on um, closer at home, I wouldn't say isolationist, but really kind of hard-nosed uh, foreign policy. Younger people are more likely to you know, identify environment as a key priority of Canadian foreign policy. And that's pretty clear. Um, younger Canadians are uh, more likely to think about immigration as a key foreign policy issue. They're more likely to think about the, the armed forces should be there to protect Canadians and help Canadians at home. So aid to civil power, uh, more so than deploying in peacekeeping by a lot, by like 20 points, which is a lot. And that's a big difference. Future and I, like there's two hypotheses. Either there's the Justin Coulomb hypothesis where, you know, for like we haven't done peacekeeping since the 19, the mid 1990s. So younger Canadians have really no, you know, real good example of what that brings to our identity, our, our, um, our, our 
and our role in the world and the reputation. And so they don't have like a, like something that can attach it or younger Canadians have live a different international system. Like most of us have been, you know, living through 9-11 and Afghanistan and Iraq. And that's our main, you know, international experiences, the 2008 financial crisis, and then like the COVID impact. None of this is good for international institutions. A lot of this is a much more, I'd say, you know, um, negative or at least, you know, concerning events. And, and that probably shapes how people think about these issues. They think about like, well, I'm not gonna turn to the UN or the WHO to do certain kinds of things. I'm gonna focus on other things. Um, I don't know what that means for Canadian foreign policy. I think there's a lot of data and a lot of work that has to be done in those kinds of things. And we have to kind of do like experiments and survey experiments to kind of identify where that goes. Um, and there, there, there isn't a lot of public opinion polling, a lot of research done in that grant, uh, like in Canada. In the US, we would have this every year and the, the Council for Foreign Relations does this every year. Interestingly, the, Amer the younger Americans are also less enthusiastic about UN peacekeeping and all of this. They're a lot more isolationist than their peers are. And so, uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done still in that environment. Thanks very much, JC. Uh, we are we have a couple of questions for uh, Jocelyn, and then uh, seeing as we're into our final uh, ten minutes, I think we're going to ask everyone to give some some concluding remarks, and I'll help to guide those in just a second. For the, thank you for, first of all to to everyone who posed a question. Uh, we are limited in time, so we can't get to all of them. And indeed, this is such a uh, an interesting topic that it's probably better suited to a day long workshop rather than just an hour long uh, session because we're really getting into the fundamentals here. Uh, but if we don't get to your question, please do feel free to send it along to info at peacediplomacy.org and we'll do our best to, to send it along to, to the panelists who could get back to you. Uh, for Jocelyn, on a deux questions pour vous. On a une question en français et une question en anglais. La question en français, c'est qu'est-ce que le Canada peut faire pour regagner son identité internationale sur la scène internationale? C'est une grande question et je sais que vous avez un oui. livre qui va venir bientôt, mais si vous pouvez répondre en 30 secondes éventuellement, uh, voilà, the uh, Coles Notes version. Et puis une question en anglais, a question in English for you as well, uh, is uh, if we can identify right now a, um, a persistent decline of Canada's foreign service over the years, uh, if you accept that as a premise, uh, then what implications does that have for Canada's ability to develop white papers and assess and act on its interests? Alors pour répondre à, à, la, à la question en français, c'est vrai que c'est difficile de mettre le doigt sur une chose en particulier, mais il me semble que aux affaires étrangères et dans les autres ministères qui sont responsables de la politique étrangère, il pourrait y avoir un peu plus de ce que j'appelle les idéateurs plutôt que les opérateurs. C'est qu'en ce moment, dans la bureaucratie de, des affaires étrangères, mais ça se retrouve certainement à la Défense nationale ou ailleurs, euh, les gouvernements euh, ont favorisé une, une gestion euh, très managériale du personnel qui fait en sorte que ceux qui arrivent aux commandes euh, de la politique étrangère ou de défense sont d'abord et avant tout des techniciens, des administrateurs, des gestionnaires qui demain matin peuvent changer de ministère euh, et continuer leurs activités. Et vous n'avez plus aux affaires étrangères de sous-ministre ou de sous-ministre adjoint qui connaît non seulement la machine des affaires étrangères parce qu'ils ont fait carrière euh, au ministère, mais qui connaissent la politique étrangère et les relations internationales. Et j'ai trouvé ça très surprenant lorsque j'ai passé un an au bureau du ministre de rencontrer des gens qui n'avaient aucune idée de ce que c'est que les relations internationales, mais qui savaient comment gérer un ministère, comment gérer une administration. Euh, voilà. Et, et ça, ça me semble, ça me semble un, un problème pour euh, un pays du, qui est membre du G7 et qui veut agir sur la scène internationale. C'est que si vous ne produisez plus d'idées, eh bien, nécessairement, personne ne s'intéresse à vous alors que dans les années 60, 70, 80, 90, on produisait des idées qui étaient débattues et ensuite adoptées par la communauté internationale. Et vous connaissez tous les, toutes les idées qui ont été adoptées, que ce soit la Cour pénale internationale, la sécurité humaine, etc. Donc, nous avions un rôle à jouer parce qu'on était des producteurs d'idées 
nous ne le sommes plus depuis une vingtaine d'années. L'autre question, si vous pourriez la répéter parce que votre, votre micro a été interrompu. Uh, désolé, donc l'autre question, c'était la question en anglais, and it's uh, if you accept the premise that there is a current decline in the quality of our foreign service, uh, what implications does that have for our ability to develop white papers as a means of formulating policy in Ottawa, uh, and also our ability more broadly to assess and act on our interests? Well, I think I have uh, answered it in, in French, uh, because uh, <laughs> we lack... Uh, when, I, when I look at the uh, def defate and perhaps the national defense also, but uh, we seem to promote people who are technicians uh, and uh, they, they, they are lacking ideas uh, to, uh, to develop uh, or foreign policy and or national defense policy. And uh, I would like the, the, the government to understand that when you, uh, when you think about foreign policy, when you plan about foreign policy, you have to understand the world around you. And you have to understand your own diplomacy. And uh, this is what is lacking. And uh, that's why perhaps we have uh, an intellectual blockage you know, in, in Canada among or elites. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Jocelyn. Uh, so to conclude, we are in the final few minutes here, so I'd like to give everyone one minute to conclude if possible. Uh, and just to uh, uh, gear your remarks a little bit towards Canada in an evolving great power rivalry. Uh, there's uh, an assessment out there that, that some would hold uh, that Canada and, and Canadian and U.S. interests do not necessarily align in every respect in a world of great power rivalry in which the United States may be at times more interested in taking powers such as China head on, uh, whereas Canada, as we've seen under the Trudeau government at least, has tried to maintain some, somewhat of a, of a balance or equilibrium there. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, what you would identify uh, as, as Canada's interests in this world of great power rivalry, the extent, including the extent to which we may see some divergence between Canadian interests and U.S. interests, and what that might imply for our ability to put together a coherent vision of our own national interests that could transcend party lines, particularly as it relates to China, because that seems to be the hot button issue these days. But there were many questions in, in the Q&A as well that dealt with other regions. So if you feel like there's another region of expertise that you would like to weigh in on, uh, please uh, do let us know. I'd like to start off with uh, Anne, and then uh, let's move on to Chris after that. Thanks very much. Wow, all in a minute. Okay, we don't want to get caught up in the, the Cold War on uh, between China and the US, but what we do need to accept is that we need to exercise some pragmatic realism towards these issues, sticky partners, uh, adversarial relationships, um, because as we found out with other partner countries, the same sort of leadership doesn't last forever. And um, we can stand up and rant and rave about things that we really care deeply about. But with other things, we've got to show some room to cooperate uh, and be agile. So I think communication, strategic communication is a very important word for Canada at the moment. Why? Because when I've been working in multilateral environments on the ground, multinational environments, um, the, the strategic intentions are quite clear coming from other countries. Sometimes I feel that where Canada has so much to offer, the strategic intentions are, are, are not well understood. Um, you know, the, the FIAP and the um, LC initiative, et cetera, things like that are very laudable indeed, but there are cogs in a bigger system that is yet to be defined. Um, somebody mentioned in the, in the chat, peacekeeping. It's, it's, it's not a place for us in the future because there's no traditional peacekeeping to, to keep out there. The UN is hamstrung because of the veto power of certain actors. Um, I think Canada is, 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 is very good at convening and peace building, etc. The diplomatic capacity is a real issue to me. We have such a story to tell that everybody wants to hear out there and, and, and get some help and assistance with. But we need diplomatic infrastructure on the ground as a means to tell the story. So, I mean, lastly, if I could just leave with this thought, to be secure, we need to be prosperous. And to be prosperous, we need to take the environmental issues into consideration, but we need to have quite a good 20, 25 year pivoting strategy that will, will get us there, like Germany did with the transition from coal 
we are not seeing any of these things. And somebody wrote into the chat, do we need a conceptual framework? Absolutely, just to guide the analysis and the output. Thank you. Okay, we have already hit five o'clock, but I think that everyone is interested in just giving some brief wrapping up thoughts. So if they can, in 45 seconds to a minute, each of you, uh, please go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I would say um, when I look back at, let's say the last 20 years, conservative and liberal governments have done a, actually a tremendous job in uh, forging trade agreements globally with all kinds of partners. We seem to be, despite all the warts that we always talk about, very, very clever. In terms of our interests, we're very also clever about where we put our people, our military people. You know, we see our military people now for in Latvia, Ukraine, Romania, sailing in the Mediterranean, the Asia Pacific. We've just finished commanding the NATO uh, training mission in Iraq for the last two years. Very, very strategic placements. What is lacking, and I think what my fellow panelists, panelists would agree, of course, is uh, with me, I think, uh, is, is that we don't have anything coherently tying things together. If you go on the web and you look at the government web pages, you've got all the policy you ever wanted. It's just not pulled together in a nice tidy document. There seems to be a need sometimes to have these sorts of things, um, but at the moment we don't have it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. So I guess that this is a great format in which to launch the discussion and recognize these needs, and then let's hope we can all get together again soon and discuss it in even more depth. Uh, perhaps over a course of a day-long seminar or something. That would be great. Uh, over to Jean-Christophe uh, for his uh, final remarks. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I, I try to be a Bayesian thinker, which means that I try to think about new information and try to re, you know, reassess what I think. Right now, when somebody asks me, like, what's Canada's, you know, position in the great power competition, I'm confused, and I don't know where to go. And I update my, you know, my things on, on a weekly basis. I think right now, the two, you know, the, 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 the China option doesn't work. Um, it's not just because of what Canada does. It's also because what of, like, China, China's um, uh, behavior. Uh, when we look at polling, you know, 10, 15 years ago, China was considered one of the most enthusiastic places for Canada to involve and engage with. Now it's reducing down to 20%. Uh, if I was, you know, conducting China's, you know, soft power public diplomacy, I would be like, wow, like whatever we do, this doesn't work. Um, and, and we need to find another way to do this. And having, you know, wannabe diplomats, you know, tweeting at at our prime minister and trying to do wolf diplomacy actually doesn't give the results that we think it gives. Um, however, I'm also concerned with our relationship with the United States. I think it's a lot less reliable than it used to be. Um, and it's not just the Trump administration. We saw this under the Obama administration and slowly but surely we're gonna, we're gonna have more and more problems with the Americans who are retrenching and less willing to even give the Canadians a break sometimes. Um, I think that we need like a third option which are likely allies and bilateral, engaging in better bilateral relationship with some countries that we understand and like to engage with. Germany, France, UK, Australia, South Korea, Japan, and maybe invest a lot of money and a lot of diplomatic effort toward these countries and, 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 and expand our group of friends. Um, and that's where I would think that our, our way of doing this uh, would work a little bit better. If we put all our eggs in the US basket and if we drop the, the basket, then we're gonna be you know, stuck. Um, the, the best way is to put eggs in a lot of baskets. We're gonna forget some of these baskets and that's fine. Uh, but we, we have to kind of you know, diversify even our diplomatic relationship and the group of friends we're dealing with. Merci beaucoup. Et Jocelyn, l'équilibre des puissances au niveau mondial n'est pas ce qu'elle était justement avant, donc ce qui réduit éventuellement la possibilité du, du Canada de, de retrouver son influence au sein de plusieurs différents corps. Donc, s'il vous plaît, des dernières remarques si vous avez un moment. Je ne mettrai pas le doigt là-dedans, mais je dirais quelque okay. chose. Depuis 20 ans, on a l'impression que, que le Canada n'a plus grand-chose à dire au reste du monde et donc il se paye des discours moralisateurs essentiellement fondé sur les valeurs. Il est temps, je crois, de revenir à quelque chose de plus sensé, c'est-à-dire une politique étrangère plus prudente, une réflexion plus prudente, tout en étant audacieuse. Voilà. 
Magnifique, c'est super. Bah, merci beaucoup à tous uh, de nous avoir rejoints aujourd'hui. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, for more information, please feel free to check out our website at peacediplomacy.org, where we have some recent publications, including on China's role uh, in the JCPOA or on nuclear negotiations, as well as a recent paper by yours truly on the future of Canada-Russia relations, which may be of interest as well. Thanks again for joining us et à la prochaine. Au revoir. Au revoir.